So, we have a beautiful lecture now how to learn hidden about hidden skills of the kids. Please support the speaker with your applause, Sergey. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you switch on the presentation, please? And I'll be more visible here. The title of my presentation has been concocted uh, right before this event. We talked about confidence, now we'll talk about individuality. Not enough time for this, but let's start probably by discussing modern approaches to measuring the individuality, force of nervous system, agility. And then I thought to myself, why not go through modern scientific theories? Hopefully, partially you know what the classical Big Five. If not, ask questions and I will gladly respond. One of the standard tests and approaches to identify the way our brains operate is called Big Five. It stems from linguistic analysis. It goes like this. You fill in the questionnaire, a long one, a couple of hours. The Big Five questionnaire is about 400 questions. And the idea being that each of those questions identifies certain traits of an individual. How do we know that the, those traits exist in the nature? Well, actually, they don't. It's a scattle came up with all the words from the dictionary describing a human being good, bad, ugly, vulgar, thousands of uh, words like this and tried to combine all, all those words with a factor analysis. Whether they are connected, then they belong to certain factors. So Kettle identified 19 factors, but then it turned out that it's too much identifying all 19 traits. And as a result, it just dwindled down to a big five tests. I don't like it necessarily, but it's the best thing that there is out there. So what is the big five approach? Extrovert or introvert, good-natured, how easy you form social networks and is able to cooperate, uh, conscientiousness, an interesting indicator, the only one of those five that has any connection to intellect and partially openness to new experience. Neurotism, that's an indicator of emotional stability. A person with high neurotism is usually concerned, highly concerned, about any novelties, any changes. And the final important modern one, uh, like I said, partially connected to intellect, openness to new experience. So, do those big five exist? in the nature or we just uh, artificially created them from the dictionary. Well, I read about three dozen researches that showed connections with the brain structures and a couple of dozen that claim that there are no connections at all. It's still a controversial issue, but that's the best one available to identify what a human being is all about if you want to uh, wait or evaluate another individual, that's the best one. Our R&D lab researches the eye movements with the help of tracking 
uh, equipment cameras recording where your eyes are moving and try to identify which objects you are looking at. Last year there was a beautiful research where students were allowed to walk uh, along the streets using the eyeglasses, tracking the eye movements and correlating them with big five indicators. So this is something in our individuality that we can use to evaluate our behaviors. It's not just a set of uh, terms from the dictionary. Why do we need those factors? Uh, not mixing the previous confidentiality lecture and this one, individuality. It's important to recognize that the science needs to study those factors to identify how a certain population with certain genes operates and structures itself. There is a group research effort, but when we talk about our individual needs, uh, educational uh, or others, we are interested in individual, not group traits. Anyway, such research gives us insights how to operate with those indivi individuality traits. These are the research of twins, which demonstrate how certain traits of character are connected with some genetic characteristics. One hour is enough to go through one trait, but the level of neurotism, for instance, uh, is directly correlated with the level of serotonin in the brain. But this level is flexible. We have serotonin receptors. There are seven types of them. And each one of us has a couple of subtypes. We have uh, the carriers of serotonin, those particles that not even particles, but molecules that uh, seize it for processing purposes. So in order to identify the level of serotonin, we need to measure receptors, transporters, the feedback molecules, all the modern antidepressant pills operate using them. And only when you started dozens of genes you can recognize to what extent the p this personal traits would impact his level of serotonin. Each of those genes could flexibly change and mo be modified. So all those modern researches are extremely complicated, in-depth, and require molecular chemistry, populational genetics knowledge to boost. These are monozygote uh, twins and the white are not and this is the difference of genetic factors. And all those factors that describe a person in front of you, they depend a lot about genetics. 0.4 to 0.8 correlation level, sometimes intellect as you can see it here, uh, up to 0.8 uh, depends on genetics, which is not necessarily true, but the correlation does not necessarily <laughs> mean direct <coughs> re relationship. It's just a mathematical connection within a group. Neurotism, ex being extroverted and others, they are at the level of 0.5 uh, correlated to genetics. and the. Uh, conclusion out of this insight is quite straightforward. The person you're talking to, uh, you bear no chance to change the character of this person. For some reason, uh, that's what is needed for this person. A person with high level of neurotism, this neurotism exists, exists as an evolutionary adaptation. At the basic level, our connection to the outside world depends on two factors. Well, there are many more, but the easiest model identifies just two. 
a searching behavior, the ability to study the environment, look for something new, depends on this searching activity levels that allows you to explore the outside world. If you put a rat in a cage, what a normal rat would do, run around and smell everything and the, uh, identifying the level of activity could be measured by how many circles they uh, ran around this cage, dopamine system. But in addition to the searching system, there is a panic system which directly uh, connects to the level of neurotism. So you are in a rural area, in savanna, where you can be eaten, but you need to find food not to be hungry. So you need to have the panic system on the alert level. When there is danger, you will turn around and flee. But in the real world, what happens? Some people have a more developed searching system. They strive to find something new. Another has a panic system in place, high level of neurotism, defends and protects himself more. What's the idea of this genetic variability? Well, I'm running ahead of myself now. Individuality exists to resolve two tasks. Individual adaptations, depending on which environments you li live in, which problems you uh, come across, the system could adapt itself. And the populational evolutionary adaptation, which are needed to, for the population to survive. There are two receptors, dopamine receptors, R7 receptors, and some others. What the R7 receptor is all about? <laughs> it happens with people in southern Eastern Asia, China, Korea, Japan, low level of migration. As soon as they settle there, they sit there. But look at the populations where this uh, level of this receptor is as high as 0.8. Almost 80% of population have Mayans, Wachiba, Quechua, Indian tribes. These are the tribes that migrated uh, the latest from the African cradle of the civilizational history and they ended up in the southern parts of southern America four or five thousand years back. These are the peoples that whose behavior always moved them forward, they never stopped. And what their behavior uh, forced them to do, that caused the uh, shaping of their psychology. In Russia there was a research, students of some college were evaluated in terms the number of people with this dopamine receptor R7. On the f first year students, 16%. Slavic populations, that's the average percentage. While on year three, only 2%. What happened with the others? They dropped out because they uh, drank too much or were involved in brawls. They need some challenges. If the environment is not presented, they will find it. Well, depending on the culture, if the culture is striving to explore something new and to face challenges and to be exposed to risky behavior like drinking and brawling, that's what they're going to do. But if these are people who are uh, uh, surveying new territories, well, they're explorers. It's just that their uh, traits were not properly used by the society. That's how it works, and that's how it was formed within thousands of years, and how it keeps working even now. A fantastic research this year, how different co cognitive functions 
connects to functional symmetry of our brain. Uh, for instance, language, right, semisphere, uh, spatial, that's left, and this is the atlas of lateralization, which cognitive the functions, which semispheres are mostly related to why I show you this graph, this figure. About 600 cognitive processes and uh, capabilities of a person identified. Just try to evaluate the uh, capacities of each person and some have it more vivid than others. And if you want to understand a person and try to describe him, even if it's through Big Five system, you will describe only a small percentage of his in individuality. So the very serious problem of modern science, we can, we know nothing about how to honestly describe other individualities. They only talk about the standards of biological trends, like the system of panic or the system of searching. So that's the claim. Our individuality starts with those two systems. Big bear system, brain activation, big brain incubation system. One needs to avoid something dangerous, other to come closer to what is tasty, pretty, cool. So initially those two systems are differently balanced. One person uh, is more about approaching, others about fleeing. But for each of those functions, they will have different percentage. So individuality is an extremely complicated stuff. This is what I shown you at the previous lecture. Depending on how brain is structured, uh, you can learn whether they can learn foreign languages easy or not. There are a couple of uh, uh, research papers that there are tests with verbal uh, commands which would uh, identify whether a person has uh, linguistic capacities. And different people will have different efforts that they need to invest. And it will be weird to live in the world when a person finds it difficult to learn a language and then his status drops down tremendously. What if he has other capacities? The problem of modern world is that we evaluate people based on a set of a handful of parameters, uh, losing sight and track of all the others. And individualization is just the way of identifying those individual traits and finding the application for each individual depending on what they are capable of most. Thus, we can see that a huge number of such individual capabilities are de dependent on genetics, on mo molecules, etc. <coughs> but there are three laws that govern it all. All behavioristical traits of people are uh, dependent on genes and on your ancestry. This is an important law that you have to keep in mind at all times, which allows you to adequately set goals, uh, educational goals. The effect from the genes is always much more uh, powerful than the effect from the uh, upbringing in one family. Don't try to see pictures in the radio. There aren't any there. And from the practical standpoint, the third law is important for us. The large part of variability could not be explained neither by genes nor upbringing in the family. That is to say, part of our behavior uh, comes up accidentally based on situations that is difficult to focus. And if you think properly about this, it's a sample room. Just imagine your own life. In your life, you have individual traits that could have been evolved differently, could be impacted by accidental events. Just came across a person and then became embarrassed and started uh, behaving differently. It's impossible to forecast this. Huge 
percentage of our individual baggage and luggage depends on accidental events, not uh, forecasted by the school or uh, dedication of parents. They come up accidentally. So don't worry about what we cannot possibly impact and that is beyond our control. If we have any tools that we can apply to measure something and in order to uh, understand a person we need to measure something, the basis of the civilization, of the science is to uh, interpret everything with the help of figures, digits, but the deeper we go there, the better we understand that it's impossible. Here are two women with a similar level of intellect. Just imagine that in some countries in the educational systems they measure the level of intellect. Uh, what are our state graduation exams or American sets are different from the system of measuring the intellect? The specialization of tests, but they're all about digits and figures. So are these people similar? No, completely different. The fact that they have the similar level of intellect tells nothing about them. That's a hopeless exercise when you want to measure one individual. When you measure population of 10,000 people, then it's a useful test, you can use it. But using the test and looking at the grades in the school to uh, measure difficult principles is virtually senseless. Uh, uh, making average measurement is senseless, like GPI for Americans just doesn't make any sense. The main problem here is when we give somebody a grade, we put them in the vicious circle. This is a cognitive effect of the million self-prophecies. If I decided that my intellect is of this level, then I, s I will start behaving based on this knowledge. Intellect is an amazingly stable thing. It might not change that much, but for some it changes a lot. Why? Because we don't know why. How come one person stays with the same level of intellect? Well, it can be age calibrated, but the correlation is 0 0.8 to 0.85. But for some people, it changes a lot. If it's a, the negative change, then it's pathology. But often enough, it uh, uh, has positive changes, and nobody knows why. Another important issue. OK, we talked about genetics. That's important. But what's more important uh, is the social context. Look, a beautiful research, one of the big statistical researches, Fern Gates, uh, research that was started as the heart disease uh, research, but it uh, gave a lot of answers to the question how such uh, society operates. Using graph method, they built this network of people and they evaluated the level of happiness of those people. And you can easily see in blue people with the least level of help, green in between, and yellow with high level of happiness. As you can see, we can see clusters. Happy people live with happy people. Unhappy people live with unhappy people. Similar slides could be shown about the obeseness. Obese people live with obese people. Fit people live with fit, fit people your surroundings form you much more than you think and these uh, happens subconsciously and we can uh, hardly control it. If we talk about individuality, there are three main principles that we have to keep in mind when you evaluate a person, characterize them or you think to yourself, he's this or that. Uh, the principle of diversity. Individualities are very diverse. For instance, if the diagnosis is he's aggressive, ask yourself the question, he's aggressive where and when? Probably he's aggressive only when he is with classmates or 
when he is with his parents, or his aggression is towards grown-ups or little uh, boys or girls, and different types of aggression based on different factors. So aggression would be diverse, not homogeneous. Principle of context, we mentioned this. Context could change anything in your perception of individuality, and regardless of what are the basics of measuring the context, it can still change and impact the uh, individuality. And the evaluation of capabilities should stem not from the capabilities, but from the context, context itself. I d I understanding why a person did this or that, why he has low self-esteem, because he cannot resolve certain math problem, or the power of his nervous system is low, and it takes him one hour to give up and not uh, finish up the test. Well, so this is, again, doesn't make sense, this test. Or another uh, example, you have two kids, one learns simple math rules in th uh, one hour, another one in three hours, and then they were learning some other math rules, and it happened vice versa now, a real life example. And the principle of plural paths of further development. Each of the capabilities is adaptive. The high level of neurotism, for instance, if you hire an employee who should perform certain um, functions that require high level of attention, take an anal retentive person, a perfectionist, a person with high level of uh, stress and concern. He will be ideal, ideal. But if you hire somebody with high level of extrovert capabilities and you expect that he will be anal attentive and become a good designer, uh, when you listen to a person who says that, oh, it could easily be done, I would not even talk to him because I can recognize that this person uh, would not be uh, focused on delivering some task hours and hours to come for days to come. So it all depends on the path of development what we're talking about. This picture I like a lot from th the book of Out with the Average worth reading. The knowledge of individual traits d does not allow you to focus the behavior of a concrete person. Correlation between the behavior and, and individuality is at the level of 0.3. That is to say, if you measured an, an intellect, well, the obvious example, to what extent school grades correlate with achievements of a person? That's it. You will get my meaning from now on. On many occasions I saw people who were getting bad grades most of their time in school. Then they get married, they change their priorities, they graduate among one of the best students and they find employment abroad. So you can't really forecast during your freshman years what's gonna happen at the time when you graduate. It will all depend on the life circumstances. Now, what impacts genetics? What impacts basic characteristics? Unfortunately, the same exact things we try to fight. How poverty can develop individual can help develop individual characteristics of a child. A low social and economic status. It's connected to the high stress environment where the child is living. A high level of stress hormones unfortunately delays the development of tissue. If you have an injury, if you have a swollen knee, and you will use glucocorticoids a few times, then you take apart that joint, you will see all those muscles that look very feeble, like mucus. That's how those steroids act. 
They exhaust the body to live through this difficult period and then at some point you will be able to recover. So this uh, continuous stress actually ruins the nervous system because this is a tissue. And also there is dependence. The lower social status is the thinner is the cortex. Uh, the worse is the memory. And this is a part of your intellect. This is how can you hold images in your memory. Your emotions are not properly regulated and there is no self-control which actually can forecast your success in the future. Unfortunately, we have all this. But generally, there will always be children who will develop normally. They have a strong, robust nervous system. But the problem of children's stress has to be addressed by the system. Then there is another important thing, as you can see. This is a brilliant piece of work by one of the geniuses of neurobiology. He was the first one who learned how to evaluate red behavior when they were showing emotional localization we couldn't hear because it was ultrasound when you tickle a red it's gonna laugh but they use ultrasound so he was able to evaluate this ultrasound and he was able to measure when they have fun when they play when they're sad so he looked at the change in the expression of the genes during one episode of play. Between 10 to 15 minutes they were playing around like kids. One hour later their brain activity has increased. 186 genes have increased. They are activity in the brain. One of the key genes is GF1. That's the gene that's responsible for growth. The bodybuilders use it for growing their muscles. So they played and their brain grows. So after six hours of this play the uh, gene was expressed 17 percent more than before so the best way to protect the brain of a child from stress and trauma let him play let him play and that's it. that is an obvious fact but in this stupid world where parents keep taking their kids from one club to another kids stopped playing with each other they just don't have time for play so the stress the social stress that you can come across let's say you go to school for the first time that's a stress you know when you're going to go on vacation somewhere so you're expecting something new that means stress and you are getting all excited so going to a new school is a stress just let them play that's the only way that we know how we can cope with that kind of stress look shooters will act exactly like this but they only work in one narrow frame all the uh, research about computer games show one problem they're not very bad they develop uh, your you know side vision and the speed of response but the question is about the age when you can start playing them if it's between six and seven years old then kids subconsciously learn this relations i am copying another person and i'm trying to understand him in computer games you don't have that interaction that thing does not reflect your emotions i'm looking at you now 
and you're nodding so I'm getting feedback from you right and I'm now talking to you again so that is what we have in real life and computer games don't have it I try to make sure that they do this in the future and in the future I think that there will be this intonation in computers but this is a very complicated task because our brain is very complicated and it tracks very clearly if there is understanding between the interlocutors or not I'm gonna give you an example there is this uh, nice paper by Barbara Kuhl and she had a very simple experiment so she worked with toddlers and she allowed them to uh, communicate with their nanny who was speaking Chinese and then they were sh she was talking to them through the screen and she was observing the kids but it's a different kind of cooperation and then over the radio so this is the result over three weeks they started recognizing Chinese phonemes pretty much at the same level as the native speakers but those who were dealing with real person not the screen not the radio because there is you know why should I look at the screen yeah I, I or I listen to the radio I lose interest very quickly but because there is no communication with this interlocutor if he's playing games 12 plus and he is past the social learning then there are other problems well it depends on the reason well yesterday this 15 year old won three million dollars playing computer games well it depends it's a very complicated question it's all about the context so let's say I play soccer on my PC and then I want to go to a club and play full I won't be able to play properly because I remember me running in the virtual soccer pitch and I'm trying to project my image on the real pitch so I already played I'm, my brain is tired and doesn't matter whether it was a virtual movement or real so mm, only, only images matter in this case not your muscles if I will start playing actual game I will not be as good and it's not really a joke we have the same situation with adults last year I can't remember the name he's an NHL player from Sweden so he did did not play for three days and he could not score during 18 games then he spent the night doing Fortnite or playing Fortnite and he's 18 I think uh, and he has signed a multi-million contract but the psychologists are trying to keep him away from playing Fortnite because after spending days and days playing Fortnite he just scored into his own goalie so it's neither good or bad it's just about the context where these people live so it's about this intonation uh, relations or interaction I was talking to a cartoon company and we were developing a program and they have cartoons for one plus so they are drawing cartoons for kids of this age of one plus and this is manipulation this is bad and this will decrease the intellect because our intellect depends on how we develop social maps so our intellect you know if we can solve uh, equations it's because we learn how to see who is stronger Sasha is stronger than Petya Petya is stronger than Sasha and so on this is a logical construct and we base ourselves on these constructs and that's how we solve something more complex so if in childhood you learn how to solve these tasks then you will be able to solve similar tasks or similar problems in the future if you look at older age the uh, puberty age we have, a, we have this problem of bullying this is where they measured the level of protein 
reactive protein. This is a marker of inflammation. If we have a disease and we go to do blood tests, so and if the doctor will do this, he will look at the C-reactive protein. And this is the level of C-reactive protein among people who have not been in a situation where they were bullied in school. This is the level of protein among bullies. These are the victims, and these are both victims and bullies. And there is a, a there is this big difference. See, here the immune system is very tense. It's overworked. It's always ready to something bad. They're always ready to start this immune response. It's always tense. And this is this. That's what they're gonna have f during their entire life. This changes lives of kids, and you cannot bring this back. Bullying is natural, you know that, right? They just establish their status, they handle each other. Now, the probability that kids will be exposed to bullying in our country is 10 times more than in Finland, Sweden. So we can build a very good education system, but we will not be able to avoid this phenomenon. So. You can show your strength by, you know, showing your skills on a climbing wall. But you don't have to beat somebody up. You just have to channel this energy through different, to different objectives, different uh, areas. And this changes people, both people, both kinds of people. And the most serious personality disorders are met among those people who were both victims and bullies. This is a logical trap. They think that bullying is bad and I'm bad, hence my self-esteem is going to be like this. I'm bad. And people around me are also bad and this is going to impact their entire lives. This question is very complicated, and it all depends on the context. But you are kind of putting this through yourself. You cannot just put up a screen. But we put up those screens very easily in life. Yesterday, we were talking about this art project. And I forgot the name of the artist who had a project in Pinchuk Art Center. So he paid the war veterans to just sit in the corner for 200 grivna a day. And this actually shows the uh, development or lack thereof of the society. That's the truth. Now, what can be done and how we can regulate business? It's a very interesting thing. It helps adapt certain models. S you know, they take a research model and they translate it into a tool and I'd like to show you this biological model which is based on the neurobiological research for the last three decades. It's called uh, SCARF, something which is nice and cozy and safe. And it shows things that must be implemented so that this person will have maximum potential for realization. So he has to have the, ho the following, the status, the desired status. Not everybody wants to be on top of the pyramid, but nobody wants to be on the bottom of the pyramid. Somebody is okay with being in the middle. 
so he has to attain the status in the group which he deserves in his opinion then the uh, certainty uh, confidence in your future and it changes behavior of people in very unpredictable ways so this neurotic behavior and anxiety that's based on your s lack of certainty then uh, autonomy the feeling of control over what's happening and we don't have it in our education system the ability to control what's happening that's the basic of your needs those are the basic needs of human beings they are pretty much on the same level as you desire or need to sleep and you need to eat because if you don't eat you will have a feeling of hunger if you don't have autonomy then you will have stress then uh, relatedness the feeling of safety in the world friendship not hostile relations and motivation which is developed at the around at the age of six or seven and then it becomes dominating thus you know equality freedom and friendship that is a very childish uh, need and a lot of politicians speculated this is an example why this is important this is a wonderful um, chart that shows you the happiness levels and the income the income growth the happiness level doesn't grow because for happiness you have to have this not just mm, your realization of your biological needs this is one of the examples of autonomy and I like it very much it's a long read and I usually send presentations to people but this is what they did they did it in a senior citizen's home and this is what happened the uh, administration came down to the uh, residents and they said we want to make your rooms more comfortable and we bought flowers for you and we bought a TV set which you can watch in the common room on the ground floor those people who were the residents uh, they were told that these plants are yours you can do nothing the uh, staff will water the flowers and the TV set will only have one channel it will be always on you can watch it anytime you like so f for the first floor residents they said if you take a flower it's yours you will water this flower if you want TV set it's yours but you decide which TV channel to watch now what happened six months later the uh, group with responsibilities their health improved compared to those who had no responsibilities the ground floor people the uh, mortality rates from the ground floor increased 30 percent the first floor only 15 percent so this is about autonomy and this is how it works now uh, relatedness it's a very simple experiment showing how people to tolerate pain these are rowers and there is a classical test where you put your hand into the ice cold water so this is how they were keeping their hand in the water before they s rolled and after they rolled so those who were in the team not rowing solo their tolerance to pain was less significantly than those who rode solo so to solve a task you have to use a group we fight difficulties easier we solve problems easier we can apply more effort when we work in a team and we can tolerate pain if we better if we uh, do something as a team I 
I wanted to show you a video. So please uh, move forward a little bit. And he's talking about a wonderful experiment. Something went wrong. The picture's missing. So, two capuchin monkeys uh, were uh, tasked the f with a specific task. It's a long video. So, look. The uh, monkey on the left is getting a cucumber. The monkey on the right is getting grapes. See what's happening? So he's giving the rock back and getting <laughs> this. She won't give it up. That's the behavior. He's saying that this is a Wall Street protest. Can you please explain us the experiment more? They show us an economic experiment and in 2002 they got a Nobel Prize. This is about fair pay. Do you get this now? They had the rocks and they swapped the rocks for food. So rocks is an analog to money. So you give the rock, you give the f you get the food. But the one on the right was getting grapes and the one on the left was getting cucumbers. Cucumbers, of course, are not as nice as grapes and hence the response. They did it differently. But they have a way to assess what you get for the same action. And it's a basic problem. All the social systems, all the economists, all the HRs are trying to solve this problem. How do you pay people? <laughs> this is the first slide, so could you please show us the last one? So in between the uh, presentations we were discussing why it's not good to measure only one side of our personality because any action especially if it has to do with education anything intellectual cannot be measured with one criteria hence this concept of evaluation is bad when I'm comparing my evaluation results with results of others in any case I will have this feeling of unfairness. This does not reflect all my capabilities. All kids drew something and they got A's. I tried more than them. I want to get more than just an A. So I have this basic feeling of injustice and conflict because I develop stress. Evaluation is very important at a certain phase, but the younger you are, the more difficult for you is to cope with this kind of feelings. And in principle, why all this modern methodology 
and educational methodologies trying to move away from evaluation because you know education is the most conservative part of our society exactly because any kind of uh, movement away from these characteristics there is no autonomy no fairness relatedness all this brings us back to that old system to the old activation system or depletion or approach avoidance model in any situation with any stimuli anything I interact with I view this at level one through this prism am I moving towards it or am I avoiding it look at the uh, people's behavior when they talk to each other sounds start kind of stepping back but this is because your system has activated and you want to create distance in conflict when somebody approaches this means that this conflict activates this person and it makes him become more aggressive so this behavioral flexibility begins from something very simple where we are now where do we move so failure to realize these basic needs it leads us to this condition it's not very good for education and implementation of this and realization of this will lead us towards this arrow on the right that's exactly what we try to do and I'm gonna advertise my organization very quickly I do not know what's gonna come out of this I don't like to advertise myself anyway but the whole world realizes that what's happening in education it kind of works thanks God unlike with cats and so on uh, with cats if you just you know kick them they will stop learning if they kick us we still learn and that is the feature of uh, animals who live in flocks so if you want to get something out of this person more than he can you have to just stop use this one and only kind of assessment uh, the end of the year or half a year and then you have this A for math but what do you know about math maybe I don't know anything or maybe I know something so we are trying to have a formative assessment where there is an assessment immediately is happening right now and all of the uh, business training programs they try to switch to this you know formatting assessment you've done this you are being assessed you've done this you're being assessed so this stimulates training it gives you better feedback my son is studying in the US and he looks every day and his rating this you know everyday assessment became very very strong because now his rating changes depending on how well he uh, performs every day you cannot really abandon grades and also personal evaluation good not good is also present we have to have feedback because you cannot evaluate yourself therefore what we are trying to do we call it story look this is a tracker of how people view the information we track the eye movement along the text and we see how much effort he spent tracking the text so see he read the text and we see now how his eyes are moving and he's not reading here at all now he read this text for this many seconds and we're trying not to build this system I do not know if it's going to be used in education or not but the world is doing this right now so there are so many startups millions doing exactly this so we are moving towards the idea that we are going to build a system which will evaluate people on the spot 
the system will evaluate you whether you understand or not don't understand if you, the system sees that you understand the system will ask you to move on but we need to learn how to use the tool because the whole world where we live it's moving towards AI but AI is not gonna be a solution for all all the systems that work out there they require a combo between AI and a human being and we just need to understand how the systems will change our world in the future I apologize for taking too much time if it's interesting for you please sign up to our telegram subscription and if you have questions please ask